This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Hello, welcome back to another lecture of Construction History. Today we'll talk about the Byzantine and Romanesque methods of uh, design and construction and we'll look in particular at two um, uh, you know, two devices that were developed especially uh, during this period which are uh, the spherical dome and the growing vault and um, we'll begin by saying that this is a continuation of the of some of the techniques that we discussed for uh, Roman building in module one and so what, we'll, we'll, what we will be talking about today is fundamentally the influence that uh, spread from uh, the city of Byzantium, which is um, an old name for uh, the, the city of Istanbul today, uh, also known as Constantinople. And this is, it is important to give some historical context about this. So um, uh, towards the end of the, the Roman Empire, when, uh, once Rome was sacked uh, in the 5th century by the Visigoths, um, and, uh, and during, during that period, in general, uh, the empire started to um, become difficult to manage. And therefore, the Romans divided the, uh, their uh, empire into two, uh, the eastern and the western side. Now, the western side continued to be controlled by Rome, generally speaking, but the eastern side uh, set up its own center here in Byzantium or Constantinople. Now... Um, the Eastern Empire continued to prosper uh, even more than the Western. They were subject to a lot of political turmoil. And so this um, political scenery also corresponds, of course, with the establishment of Christianity in Europe. And, and from Byzantium, um, due to its strategic position and, and also had its proximity with, with the East, another culture, uh, we see the rising of, uh, of a new style of architecture, which is ecclesiastical. Uh, it's it's a, an early Christian type of architecture. And from Byzantium, this uh, tendency, these techniques and these influences um, eventually started to spread back to the West, and in particular in northern Italy and, uh, and on the uh, western shores of what uh, is formerly known as uh, Yugoslavia. So, and this is not just a story about uh, Western architecture, but it's how, somehow how Eastern uh, architectural influences also came to influence the, the West. So we will look at some examples. Um, we will look at some techniques that were common in this period. We're looking at a period in time that it's between 400 AD up until uh, 1000, 1000, 100 AD uh, and this normally is referred to as the period of Byzantine architecture or Romanesque architecture so we'll look at some examples of construction but also look at some examples of finished buildings in particular in Constantinople uh, but also in northern Italy in Ravenna, Venice uh, uh, which is here and uh, Milan now, uh, we spoke already about the Romans and their ability to uh, build uh, vaults and um, without going back necessarily into, uh, into that topic, I'd like to just remind you what the geometrical principles uh, were that uh, allowed this uh, vault construction. Of course, the material was Roman concrete, um, um, or better still, you know, opus cementitium, which is a forerunner of, of concrete of these days. Um, but the geometrical device was uh, this semicircular arch. So, so you find that most Roman architecture is based on alpha circle um, and an arch, a semicircular arch that can be left by itself as an arch structure, or it can be extruded along one direction and become a barrel vault. Or you can have two arches that are um, used uh, or oriented in a, uh, with orthogonal direction and extruded in, in both directions. And in this case, they generate what is known as the groin vault. 
Now the growing vault, unlike the barrel vault, has the advantage of discharging its loads only at four points rather than uh, along the, uh, the length of the vault itself. And then this method can be uh, taken further by um, building um, a dome that is based on a semi-circular profile again. Uh, and by revolving this profile at 360 degrees, it is possible to obtain a perfectly uh, semi-spherical surface that can be used as a dome. Now, the arch, of course, um, it's something that characterized Roman architecture. Um, we saw already, uh, we discussed about the Colosseum, for example. We saw how there was um, uh, plenty of views of barrow vaults, but also, of course, of the arch itself. Now, the arch is an interesting structure that, as you know, works only in compression. Um, it is a series of stones cut, typically, with a, a trapezoidal profile known as voussoir, and the top of the uh, topmost of these vessels is known as the crown or keystone. And the arrangement of these vessels is such that the weights and the forces of gravity transfer themselves from one vessels to the next until they reach the base or the springing point of the arch, which is known as the abutment. And this is done in such a way that. Um, the loads always somehow remain within um, the center or not too far from the center of gravity of every single Vossois and they generate a phenomenon known as thrust which is a lateral, it's a component of vertical and horizontal uh, loads of compressive stresses um, that determine compressive stresses and that uh, can generate uh, the possibility of, of a bursting of an arch. Now when, when you have two arches that are side by side, these forces of thrust somehow um, balance each other and, and therefore the structure is not subject to this problem. Um, now, the same principle of the arch can be used by extruding that shape along um, one direction, uh, in which case we uh, create the bar of vault. This is the bar of vaults of the Colosseum. You can now recognize the Roman concrete sort of approach there with rubble and porcelanic cement using it but also you find there's plenty of barrel vaults that have been used using the, the technique of opus testatium if you recall um, kiln dried bricks now um, these techniques could also of course become uh, spherical domes and the romans had developed uh, methods of construction that uh, relied on a very clever technique of construction joints known as ribs, as we said. And these ribs were mostly uh, used to uh, allow, uh, for example, domes, like in this case, to be uh, constructed in, in, in sections and then have some interlocking um, uh, ribs along the meridians of the domes through which uh, continuity of the material, the concrete in this case, could um, could be executed uh, with more ease than if it was just a pure uh, monolithic uh, uh, pole. Now, um, this is an important uh, thing to say because, as we will see, somehow this idea of ribbing uh, domes, uh, it is also the, the historical precedent that will lead us to discuss the ribbed vaults of the Romanesque and of the uh, Gothic uh, methods of construction. Now, the Pantheon, of course, is the quintessential uh, dome of Roman times, and, and you can recognize here uh, in this picture its arrangement. You can see um, it's been devised as a series of meridians and, and longitudes and parallels that sort of run uh, in, in the orthogonal direction, and eventually all day they um, culminate at the top, which is left open, the oculus. But this is a semi-spherical dome that has been obtained with one of the methods we discussed before. And uh, the section of the uh, pantheon will, will show you that there is an increase of um, section at its base uh, that is also taking care of this additional uh, thrust, which in this case is not on a plane or on a... Uh, on a line, but it's on a on a radial uh, arrangement that spreads in at 360 degrees. 
So the phenomenon of uh, the, the fundamental problem or stresses in uh, domes is the fact that you have, yes, a compressive structure, but ultimately there is a transition point normally, which is known as the hoop or a point from which um, compressive stresses can become tensional stresses, particularly at the base. So in other words, when you have vertical loads coming down from the top or the apex of a dome, once these stresses accumulate towards the bottom, they tend to develop some tensional stress at the ring. That like, in, like an arch tends to spread at the bottom, a dome that is spherical also tends to burst at the bottom. And so this bursting uh, tendency uh, creates tensional stresses. And these tensional stresses very often lead to some um, po potential for development of cracks. And in fact, uh, and this, this is a picture of, um, of the so-called Tempio della Tosse in, in, uh, in Rome that, that was uh, uh, surveyed by, by Piranesi, it's one, one of his famous you know, representation of the antiquities of Rome. And you can see here how you have some Piranesi, you know, the, the illustrator here, uh, picks up the cracks in the vaults that are clearly along the meridians of, of this dome. Now, in fact, this is the problem also of the Pantheon, and it has been observed that the Pantheon has developed uh, some uh, cracking that are, uh, dis they are enlarging themselves towards the base of, of the dome. Now, with this, you understand why uh, then the Romans had this ribbed approach, and, and this is the fundamental base we need to understand also to talk about what comes next, which is the Church of Hagia Sophia in uh, Constantinople. And um, before doing that, um, we will see how somehow this church and develops uh, and, and, and applies some of the techniques of Roman construction, but it also takes it to, to another level. Um, and the novelty of this church is the fact that it is a compound dome uh, so we said, we, we described the Pantheon, for example, as a spherical dome, and, and we said, you know, how it has a tendency to burst, hence it's um, a notorious cracking at the base. Um, but the Byzantine uh, churches developed a new technique, which is a dome that sits on a portion of a lower dome, and this lower dome is uh, somehow uh, reduced to four triangular portions of a sphere, uh, which are known as, then you can see one here and the other uh, three will be around. And these portions are known as the pendant. So the approach is here to create a dome that is um, spanning much more than you could achieve with a simple uh, semi-spherical surface by having a compound uh, profile that is uh, half a dome almost uh, that is then surmounted by a smaller dome at the top. And this allowed the, the Byzantine builders to, be, uh, to execute this magnificent uh, church, which was then, in, today is a mosque, it was eventually converted to a mosque in the 1400s, um, that still exists, is still extant in, uh, in Istanbul. And you can see here how the technique, there's a very large dome at the top, you can see the dome has a series of meridians that are expressed, which in fact are a series of arches um, that show that how perhaps there was an understanding of the cracking tendency of spherical dome, so, and, and also revealed the geometrical principles behind uh, the, the configuration of this space. And, and at the base of that, you recognize now we have some very large pendant tips that ultimately discharge the vertical loads on some very large piers. Now this is a space that is um, overall almost 60 meters in, uh, in height from the bottom and, and a significant span um, that uh, it's on the order of 35 meters at the top. So um, the configuration we're discussing here is a very large dome at the top, but then four pendentives that will discharge onto this very large piers, you can see, in these four locations. Uh, on top of that, uh, Hagia Sophia has two 
semi uh, hemicycles or he another two uh, semi domes that uh, sort of protect and, and absorb some of the thrusts of the dome. And there's a series of uh, buttresses as well that run on the opposite direction that uh, likewise sort of contain all these massive forces coming from the top. Now again, if you look at the roof, you see this is uh, a picture of the, the, the dome, this is the central dome here, and, and one of the semicircular domes on the side. And you can see how um, here the, the, uh, there's a series of arches that are uh, buttressed uh, with some uh, infills that sit in between the the, the openings of the clerestory that allows some light in and, and sort of gives this wonderful impression that the dome might be almost be lifting uh, uh, as a result of the light and the contrast but uh, it's certainly not uh, uh, there's a, a lot of solid support there in order to to prevent this sort of busting effect and transferring this down onto uh, the pendentives and uh, which are in these areas here but also transferring these loads onto some giant arches that span from uh, the four, that connect the four piers. Um, and so here the dome sort of spreads its loads uh, through these giant arches, then the arches again take these loads down to these massive piers, and some of the thrust is absorbed by the uh, hemicycles on, um, along one axis, and and on the other axis, uh, it's somehow contained by the buttresses. Now, uh, what is interesting about Hagia Sophia is, as much as it is a wonderful uh, um, a piece of architecture and construction that still survives, um, you should know that this building was designed initially in a different way, and it was designed with a segmental dome, so not so much like the Pantheon, but rather like a like just as a portion of a, of a spherical dome. And you can see what uh, it is um, according to the, the authority on this building, which is um, Roland Mainston. You can see how the uh, initial intent, uh, or the initial plan of the dome might have been a much lower um, uh, profile. Now, this lower profile is actually more problematic than, than a higher one because it generates horizontal thrust that are more pronounced. So in other words, the component of um, discharge of, of, of gravity loads it, in a horizontal section, it's, it's higher than in, for a dome that has a, a semicircular profile that tends to come um, down on a, in a more vertical way. So here the component of horizontal thrust is less, for example, than um, the one that is horizontal, where in this case it's almost equal, right? So you have both horizontal and vertical uh, components of loads that are uh, very high. In this case, it has been reduced, but the vertical component is high, but the vertical loads are not a problem in masonry because masonry resists well um, uh, compressive stresses. Now, this is proven also by the fact that there has been some archaeological uh, studies that have uh, brought to the fore the fact that the, the, the dome, in fact, was built in different stages. It also collapsed as a result of a, an earthquake um, around in the 6th century, and, um, and it was rebuilt according to that. However, so there were some in inherent faults in the design somehow um, came to uh, destabilize and create problems on the building, even earlier than the famous earthquake event. And uh, this is the final configuration of Hagia Sophia today, where you see again the, the, the four pendentives here, or two of them shown in this section. Um, they discharging onto these piers that are in this location. You can see here the uh, giant arches that are um, connecting one pier to the next. And then you have the weight of buttresses here uh, that is somehow uh, reducing again this component of uh, vertical or uh, horizontal shift and thrust uh, onto a resultant force that is more vertical than it would be otherwise. And uh, here is an example of what the effect of this uh, fairly troubled um, uh, building has had over time, where you have a situation of, of a dome that is uh, being pushing 
sidewise onto this uh, giant arches and you can see how some of this deformation have remained almost permanently in the building including uh, to the extent that some of the columns are uh, notoriously leaning uh, some columns in the gallery and again here is a view from uh, looking up which you can admire how this dome was executed with the four pendentes, the semicircular, uh, smaller domes um, along, you know, the, the one of the axes, uh, and then a series of arches that somehow connect all together and revolve around, uh, but leaving uh, a clearer story that allows light in. So when when the light comes through, it gives this sort of immaterial sense of the dome almost uh, floating above the pendentes. Although it is not, as we saw, there's so much more behind that prevents that to be a problem. Now, Hagia Sophia, of course, is the most uh, renowned example of um, uh, Byzantine architecture. But it's important to understand that that uh, significant example is not a standalone phenomenon. And in fact, uh, there's many other examples of churches, not necessarily so big and, um, and magnificent, uh, that have. Um, they, they survive and, and they've often been converted to mosques, but they still you know, you know, show what the initial intent was. And they also reveal some of the characteristic construction systems of the time. Um, now, uh, the Byzantium was an, an offshoot of Roman culture initially, um, and so it adopted some of the most important techniques of Roman construction, in particular brick construction, um, which was uh, very... Uh, useful in uh, uh, creating domes in particular uh, and, and complex configurations overhead because bricks have a certain amount of, um, uh, of tolerance that can be built into the process. So um, what the Byzantine used was bricks and often they used an, ab uh, an abundant use of mortar, not of concrete, so not porcelanic mortar, but lime mortar. Uh, the bricks were kiln dried, and, uh, and the characteristic also of this architecture was then the, uh, a finish of rendering that was the base for mosaic decoration. So, uh, so there was a, a, a substrate that allowed to, um, and a technique of construction that was not necessarily new, but it was used in a different way. It was used to give um, a scope for. Uh, spaces overhead that were able to spend reusing the principles of geometry of semicircular arches, barrel vaults, and spherical domes, and then having this additional uh, ability to cover up or, or finish the, the, the surfaces by uh, using mosaics as a way to, uh, to tell stories and, and to decorate the building inside. And, and so you can see how some of these buildings, when they've lost the mosaics, they reveal this brick construction with very large um, uh, gaps of mortar infill. And, and other times you can see how brick construction itself is not necessarily the sharpest, but, but it is somehow that, that that's, that's what makes this um, uh, the advantage of this technique that it can be finished later on with plaster. Now, this is not to say that there was not some... Uh, consistency in construction during this time and, and there was in fact some uh, recurrent um, methods of wall construction which uh, borrowed yes from the opus the statue but they also borrowed from the roman technique of the opus mixed tomb if you recall so um, here the idea is to have in the opus mixed tomb is to uh, alternate brick construction with masonry construction with bricks used to create some bands and some so, sort of opportunity to strengthen the uh, horizontality of walls. Um, and Byzantine used this uh, technique as known as the, the Constantinopolitan uh, uh, band construction, when you have masonry uh, courses intermitted by several courses of bricks. And you find that often there are some holes cut into these uh, bricks for uh, uh, inserting put logs or, or the opportunity to in insert progressively as the construction proceeds in uh, some posts to uh, support a scaffold. And another technique was then the so-called recess brick, very common too, where again you see uh, very likely you know, used in this location here, uh, where you have very large um, mortar joints apparently, but uh, they, they, 
actually uh, looking closer you find that there is a brick in field behind so this is the technique of construction as in mind happening in many circumstances so this ability of using smaller elements not necessarily large stones not precisely cut stones and uh, pick up any irregularities and distributes um, and, and, and somehow rectify any imperfections with an abundant use of mortar lime mortar again not porcelanic mortar uh, lime mortar often used in this case as a brick in fill again a remnant of the opus cementitium but without the benefit of the porcelana itself and then put logs that are used to put some transverse supports for uh, scaffolds and so it is a method of construction that allows to go up vertically but it also allows to handle materials using smaller elements like brick the ingredients of mortar and some rubble now I mentioned also about the recessed brick construction now recessed brick construction is the one that is characteristic of uh, very large uh, external mortar joints but uh, behind these very large mortar gaps there is often another brick that is being pushed in recessed in and then it's finished sort of uh, uh, to, to so that it doesn't uh, show up anymore and only only every second course in this case is revealed on uh, on the facing uh, sometimes there could have been a, um, an, another approach with um, in between the mortar joints there is some uh, infill of broken uh, bricks or uh, that are used somehow to spread the joints further and then behind this um, brick construction again you know a bit of you know opus de statue that is evolved um, you still have some uh, rubble uh, of um, fragments not necessarily of high quality not materials that are used uh, useful for finish but that are inserted in the wall thickness and here are some examples how these techniques of construction then is also married with uh, the semicircular arch of, of, of the, the, that was so popular with the Romans again here you see the same technique of recessed bricks with large bands of mortar and bricks that sort of are recessed back uh, and they're not visible anymore unless you have situations like this where buildings are ruined and some of these traces and methods of layering become apparent and then put log construction um, uh, that we use to insert scaffolds now the influences of Byzantium, as we said, spread to the west, and they spread particularly in northern Italy, but not only there, also in along the coast, the Dalmatian coast, uh, along the Adriatic Sea, on the opposite side of Italy, along Montenegro or uh, Slovenia, uh, Croatia, and, and and so forth. And so the uh, influence of Byzantium uh, was significant particularly in in the city of Ravenna now Ravenna was a city or well, still is an Italian city in the northern east uh, coast of um, of the peninsula and um, it was an important city because when um, once the uh, western roman empire was sacked by the visigoths and in the 5th century, um, uh, the emperor uh, of the time uh, just shifted the capital of the Western Empire temporarily in Ravenna. So, um, for, for obvious reasons of strategy, in order to be closer to the east and, and um, by having a, a route of connection through the Adriatic Sea that allowed to reach Byzantium or allowed to reach Byzantium also by land, um, uh, in a much easier way than having to cross the the mountains of the the center part of the peninsula so this strategic position of the city of ravenna is is somehow facilitated um the flourishing of architecture that was in connection and influenced directly by uh, byzantine influence and so this is evident for example san vitale san vitale is an octagonal um, church that was based very much on the uh, from a layout point of view on the temple of Minerva Medica it still was uh, survives as a ruin in, in Rome and you can see here the method of construction of bricks and fairly large generous mortar joints and, and again the uh, approach in this case of an octagonal plan and a surmounted by a semicircular dome 
and the use of mosaics inside, as well as the use of pots in the dome, um, a technique that was often used by Romans. Again, here's another example uh, existing in Ravenna, where uh, the Orthodox baptistry or the baptistry of Neon, um, where you, again you see that the, the almost austere brick construction, very simple, but then that's giving the, the bones and the structure to this uh, domed. Um, uh, spaces that are uh, embellished by mosaics inside and again here you find in this particular building there is uh, uh, a use of um, a series of uh, uh, of pots here that are interlocking and this is the so-called tubi fitili or um, tubes of terracotta that the Romans used for pipes that have been recycled or reused in this very novelty way in order to have a lightweight vault of terracotta um, that is finished also with the mosaic. Now the influences of Byzantium also are most evident in Venice and Venice not far from Ravenna, a bit further up north and um, a city that would flourish particularly in, in several in the centuries that followed the, the, uh, the, the flourishing of Ravenna um, but the Byzantine influence in Venice are most obvious particularly in San Marco, the cathedral of the city uh, well, you can see here a clear um, you know, um, central plan arrangement, uh, a central dome surrounded by smaller domes around and semicircular domes again sitting on the pendentives and then discharging onto these uh, uh, piers that uh, you can see here in plan. These are the pendentives and how they discharge onto these four piers that are, are domed themselves on, on in between uh, at the top, at the, the ground floor. Um, now, the older uh, footprint is clearly a, a, a Greek cross here, and you find that there's some more construction in the, the narthex, which surrounds um, the, the cathedral with this very glittering uh, uh, architecture uh, that was developed later. But if you look closely behind, you know, the uh, inevitable, you know, uh, rich decoration of, of, of the cathedral, you can see there's some austere brick construction sections. You can see how the domes are sitting on drums or brick construction. You can recognize the perfectly um, semicircular openings. And, and whereas, you know, nearby you start to see, you know, Palazzo Ducale that has some Gothic influence of a later time. And so behind this facade that evolved in time, you were able to recognize the old austere architecture that if we can observe in Ravenna, bricks, semicircular arch construction, and again, um, uh, some, some obvious uh, connections, for example, in this case, uh, that apparently, you know, it, it is argued that uh, San Marco was inspired by this church in, uh, um, in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, San Saviour in the Cora, uh, almost contemporary. You can see this link here between the fenestrations here, very, very Italian apart. So Byzantine construction was the base of what would then become also um, the Romanesque construction of medieval time. And Romanesque construction, not Roman, uh, it, it is a type of construction and again took the techniques of construction in Rome, uh, but adapted it to ecclesiastical architecture. And it, it did so uh, by using, again, the semicircular arch as the uh, generating uh, device for which uh, vaults and domes were created. Now, before, again, so the, before touching on the growing vaults, which are the most um, uh, characteristic, perhaps, method of uh, of, of vaulting and construction of the Romanesque period, uh, it's, we can start by looking again at the Barra vault. Now, the Barra vault, as we said, is a um, semicircular arch that has been extruded in one direction. And we saw again the Colosseum as the, uh, you know, the perfect playground in which uh, all different kinds of Barra vaults were developed and used by the Romans. Um, but as we said as well, um, the bar of vault generates uh, a plane of thrust, so in other words, a series of horizontal um, and vertical uh, discharge points uh, where the, the horizontal uh, component can be significant and needs to be absorbed very often by having buttressing or very thick walls on the side of a vault. Um, 
that is the structural problem of the bar of volt. But there is another problem, which is the construction problem of the bar of volt. Now, if you imagine you have to build a bar of volt like this, um, well, you would probably clearly imagine that you would need some form of false work, also known as centering, to um, uh, make sure that you can contain, you maintain the same profile as you proceed. Now, centering will be very difficult to uh, achieve um, and control for a number of reasons. Um, if you were to build this vault all in one go, you, in order to maintain its um, in in the consistency of profile, it, it might be convenient, for example, to set up a series of centerings all in one go and then proceed to vault the space above. Um, but this is obviously very difficult to achieve and, and so you'll find that more practically it is better to have a series of centerings perhaps in bays and then proceeds for example by building one section of the vault um, and then moving these frames to the next bay and continuing in that fashion. So in other words you can proceed in sections like you would do in construction today or by staging it. And in doing so, in order to interlock one volt to the next, it, it will be convenient to insert some bands or some um, lower uh, semicircular arches that can be used to disguise any joints that might occur from one stage of construction to the next. And so this is the uh, technique that uh, it, it ultimately will open up to a, a new, the new methods of construction that are also characteristic of Gothic. and. It's the idea that you build first a frame um, or a framework where you define the geometry or the, the key geometrical um, controlling surfaces or lines from which you then infill uh, the, the spaces in between. So a, a growing vault, as we saw, is a bar of vault, um, or, or part, part of a bar of vault that is somehow intersected by another bar of vault that is uh, in a running in the orthogonal direction of the first one. Now, if you have a series of banded bar of vaults and then you put a series of banded bar of vaults in the other direction, you, you obtain what is a, an open growing vault, which is characteristic of, of ecclesiastical architecture of the Middle Ages. And so, First, you, you would imagine uh, this scenario where you can build a series of arches that are simply semicircular arches in one direction, and then from the same piers you build a series of arches in the other direction. Uh, now, this would have some benefits that, particularly when four arches sort of come together at a connection point, you don't need to have any uh, major concerns for picking up the thrusts in a horizontal direction, but everything will be channeled down to the piers. But there's some some catch in this problem, and, and this is a geometrical problem that also uh, affects the construction. If you have two uh, surfaces that are uh, circular and you intersect them, you obtain a series of surfaces at the intersection that are known as groins, hence the name of groin wall, and these groins are not circular, but they're elliptical. And so, hence, again, if we use brick, for example, we might find that it's a bit easier to control uh, the geometrical, uh, uh, the inevitable irregularities that, that are much harder to control for an elliptical uh, centering that you would have in a circular form. And this somehow also um, brings further the idea of using bricks as the main method of construction during Romanesque as well as uh, from the Byzantine period. Um, now, of course, there, there's an opportunity to use stone, and there are some uh, examples that have shown that. But you can see here from these pictures where on, on the one end you have the advantage of having a series of growing vaults that can discharge only vertical loads, particularly in the central base, and take care of horizontal thrusts, thrusts on the end base. Um, so there's certainly an advantage here that you're able to open the space more. Uh, but you can imagine here the work of stone cutting that is required in order to interface all these groins together. Um, so there's another 
problem to this, which is also the management of centering or, or false work or forms that can be reused progressively. So this is an example of what you need to do if you have to build a bar of vault. This is a modern example taken from uh, happening these days with concrete. And, and you can see how um, in, if you're willing to achieve um, a simple bar of vault, you, you know, it's very simple just to set up a centering system uh, which is a uh, half a circle um, supported on some struts and in this case there's a series or you can recognize here is a series of segmental profiles that are overlapping to one another and they're kept together by these um, transverse um, boards so what will happen here once the concrete is poured and then of course there's a series of lagging or boards that give the final profile so concrete doesn't doesn't filter through um, you can recognize how there's a series of these supports in place and and the space below so people can actually walk now when the weight of the vault starts to uh, uh, apply itself on the centering what happens is that this pushes down and 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 the effect and this might push out and it might actually make it almost impossible to remove the centering if it's done in one piece so one thing that it was very important to control in barrel vaults or any kind of vaults was always the ability to remove the centering possibly by recovering them and reusing them a second time around without too much damage and you can see how here in this modern examples this would be achieved, for example, by removing these diagonals first and then lowering these separate sections of the um, uh, of segmented sections that give the shape to, to the semicircular profile of the vault. And then by doing so, you're able to rebuild and, and proceed further. So uh, the centering techniques were essential to achieve these um, uh, barrel vaults, uh, but also the growing vaults. Um, but but they, they relied always on some methods of construction that A, they needed to be simple enough to be uh, set up geometrically. Now, of course, a cir circle is very simple to set up. All you need is a string and a fixed point, stretching a string or a, or a stick and of the same length, and then rotating it at, at a pivot point allows you to draw a circle. But much harder is to draw instead an elliptical shape. And in, in that process, uh, there was a, therefore an ability, for example, like in this reconstruction here, uh, to have uh, some uh, segmental sections sitting on a springing point, and then an A-frame in between them. And this A-frame was able to be lowered separately by the other two, so that once the vault is complete and it starts to put pressure at the key there, there is the ability to slide to to slide down and, and remove a central section and then the second sections can the other sections can simply rotate and be folded away and so obviously there would have been uh, systems of this kind where there was um, some props of timber and the ability to wedge in position these different frames together another technique that would have been uh, used very likely in those days would have been to have instead of having an A-frame perhaps a larger section profile like this on both sides and a central block just under the the key of the vault uh, kept in place with with a, uh, a wedging of, of, of another timber block to prevent this to move temporarily then this block will be knocked out um, once uh, the, the vault is completed and again the two centering frames can be removed and reused and built again in, in sections therefore there's this characteristic method of construction very using very simple geometrical force work semicircular in sections in base and then using only simple shapes of semicircular profile to create surfaces that can also be complex like in this case so if you're trying to create a, a, a growing vault, you can have, for example, three centering frames all aligned and then perhaps put lagging boards over it first and then uh, create instead the intersection rather than cutting it through the boards by creating, by putting um, another series of um, 
centering frames that uh, reduce themselves progressively. And so these are still, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a not, it's a portion of a, of a bar of vault that it's uh, triangular in two directions. Uh, and then these boards would um, uh, infill and connect to, to the other uh, bar of vault. Then the vault will be uh, completed over that and then the process can be, again, the, the centuries will be removed and reused. Now, as we said, there is a problem with this system, and this is the fundamental problem of the growing vault is that the rib that is generated by two um, semicircular profiles or semi-cylindrical shapes is that the intersection generates a diagonal rib, like here, which is elliptical, and an ellipse is not an easy surface to uh, to control. So you find that the, the next step of evolution in these methods of construction was to not use um, necessarily uh, the diagonals as an elliptical shape, but rather to build the diagonals, also known as the diagon the ribs of the groins of the vaults, but build them with semicircular arches. So in doing so, imagine now if you have a situation where you have four columns, and instead of having um, instead of starting from the transverse ribs, which are the ones that span from uh, over the main nave of our church and, and the wall ribs on the side, if instead of starting from those edges of the bay, you will start from two diagonal ribs uh, from, and they are circular in profile. Um, so what you'll be doing, you'll be recreating the conditions of the uh, circular dome, like the Pantheon or Hagia Sophia. And so if you have two ribs that are actually perfectly semi-circular and they sort of intersect one another, obviously there will be the problem that um, the arches that define the, the transverse and the wall ribs would not be as high as the diagonal ribs because the diagonal will be larger in diameter than, than the transverse and the wall sides. And so this creates two uh, opportunities. One is to create a, a vault that is somehow lower at the sides of, uh, on the sides of the nave or in the transverse rib direction. Or uh, it creates the opportunity to raise the springing point of the transverse and wall ribs by creating what is known as a stilt. So in other words, the apex of all these profiles on the edge of the growing vault are at the same level. And there's a section at the base of the shorter arches that are that sort of raising them up uh, in, uh, so that they can spring at, at, at a highest point. Um, but also, this opens up an opportunity, and the opportunity is that uh, the two ribs intersecting at, uh, at 45 degrees can generate what is known as a domed ground vault. So in other words, we can regenerate the same space of a dome in over a vault. Now, this is um, easier to manage from a setting up of the, the groins, but it creates other problems when it comes about creating, for example, um, an arrangement of uh, boards and lagging that can be uh, achieved successfully. So, for example, if this is a rib or a groin that it's semicircular in this position, and, and this is the type of arrangement that we are trying to uh, recreate, you will see that there is a need to have a series of uh, centering frames or of or, or, or um, false work ribs that are um, created in order to to follow a spherical surface. So you can see how all these complexities somehow uh, create the the basis for 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 two things. A that um, without having a good control of stereotomy, which is a, a technique uh, for cutting stone using uh, very rigorous geometrical principles uh, that was not available in the medieval times. You can see how inevitably these techniques lead to the use of bricks rather than exposed masonry, and bricks that are ultimately filled with plaster. You can also see how there is a tendency here, logically, to, to build, start by building the ribs 
rather than uh, the arches on the nave and, and, and proceeds from the ribs onwards. So all these things come together just by observing some buildings of that time. So for example, let's go now to Milan. Milan, northern Italy, um, one of the cities that was, again, um, that prospered after the fall of the Roman Empire and that had significant influences from uh, Byzantium too, uh, to to much extent. But in Milan, towards 1100, um, it would, this church was built, the Church of Sant'Ambrose, a very important center for the city, charged of many uh, historical values still today. And, uh, and this church was built, uh, it's recognized by many as a perfect example of Romanesque architecture. Now, Romanesque here, because, again, it's using the Roman sort of uh, uh, ingredients of brick construction and semicircular arches. And, and you can see here um, the church is somehow embedded into um, a portico, um, a, a courtyard that leads into uh, the church. In fact, it's a very special space if you if you enter it. It's, it's, a, it's a church in the middle of a city, but sort of surrounded by this cloister feeling that... Um, almost puts you in, in a different space and mindset when you walk through still today. And, and this um, church is um, somehow uses some of those, pro it shows some of the techniques that were used to overcome these problems of the growing vaults. So you can see here in the portico, like you have perfectly semicircular arches here, um, and that are spanning in, in one direction and the other. So there's some ribs of brick construction that are apparent also in the orthogonal direction. You can see the wall rib here at the edge. And you can see there is a growing profile here that is coming together. Um, but what's characteristic of these growings is that somehow they disappear towards the top, showing that actually this is a, a domed uh, uh, vault profile. So it's a semispherical uh, dome that it's using uh, circular ribs as a set of points initially. And you can see here how the groins are somehow more evident at the base, but they somehow disappear. Because you have here a semicircular profile that is extruded in one direction and the other. But the rib itself here are both semicircular. So it's a sphere that it's intersecting two uh, cylinders on both sides that creates this... Um, uh, very, you know, sort of semi-concealed um, groin system. And you can see here the, the ribs that are clearly pronounced that lead to the entrance of the church. Inside the church, this is the plan of the church. You can, you, you were looking down here on this side, on the left hand side there of the portico. Once inside the church, you find that there's this very large two-story high lodger that lets light in. Um, there's a different type of construction, but still using this principle, you have a, um, a, a ribbed um, dome here uh, with ribs of bricks, which is semicircular. You, you recognize now here, again, a semicircular arch, in this case in stone. You can see the piers, how it discharges down. And you can see how the two ribs connect to each other. These are semicircles. And this is another semicircle, but the apex of this vault is much higher than the crown of this arch below. And so what is generated here, it's a, a domed, again, uh, profile, where you have uh, the ability to control uh, the construction by having a very a rib that defines the geometry. And then you can see here the side arch here. So this vault here would then discharge at the back into um, the the higher the gallery of the matroneo as called uh, in Italian, which uh, conceals you know uh, the, the the walls that discharge from from the top. You can see there is no windows coming here in this side. Very different, and 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 the problem that will be solved by Gothic. And you can see there's light coming in from the dome and light coming from the back from the the loggia at the front. So if you look at a section of this building, you now recognize this method of covering where you have ribs of semicircular arches and vaults that are somehow springing from this point and reaching out these higher ribs and then discharging through uh, the gallery here with these buttresses. So the, 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 the lateral loads of the, the 
uh, volts are absorbed by the piers and by a battery system behind. And then there's a dome at the top, which is um, somehow uh, completing the, the, the transept and just uh, completing the church on the opposite side. You can see here a view of the dome, and you can see how these um, arches all spring from the same point. Uh, so there's a common spring here, meaning that these will be semicircular ribs. There are of bricks that will be taller, and the stone arches that um, uh, are in the transverse and the wall ribs are smaller, um, but they all come together uh, by using a vault uh, that is uh, hemispherical. And, and this is uh, the vault itself over the intersection of the transept and the nave, where you have. Um, at the very top, of course, um, a mosaic of the saint, St. Ambrose, in this case, that has been uh, used at the crown. And you can see here how the dome is resolved within, in an octagonal way by using this sort of um, corbelled uh, pendentive, that is, again, reusing arches to, to somehow reduce the, the springing uh, s s point of the dome above. And the dome is, is composed by groins and sections that are um, uh, sections of a sphere that are somehow all connected together and uh, uh, in this octagonal arrangement. So I'll conclude here with this one. This is an important step to uh, understand in order to uh, discover then what's going to come next. And what comes next is, of course, the Gothic. So in this... Um, discussion here, hopefully we've, we've understood some of the basic principles of vaulting and some of the main challenges that surround um, this form of construction that has had so much influence and still, I believe, influences architecture today. So I'll leave you with this one uh, here and I uh, hope you're going to have a good day.